And by the way, we've got vSphere up and I'll be showing you this. So this is update 1A out all of three weeks ago and then backup vendor Nakivo came out with support for it last week. I think Veeam, we're still waiting. That's the kind of stuff you run into home lab. When you're at the bleeding edge, the very latest updates, stuff happens <laughs> and things go sideways. And that's what my presentation's about. And I'll give you an example. Um, this update in the VMUG Advantage world, we often don't have support. Maybe you don't have maintenance mode or maybe you don't want to shut down your VMs or maybe you don't even have vMotion set up or maybe you have one, only one host. So there is an ESX CLI way to update your machine. You just paste this one command in, it pulls it from the internet, you type reboot and your host is done. So that's been a popular article of mine that it really was built into you know, ESXi itself. So some labs don't even have VCSI. Now, at this point, I would encourage everyone to, you know, definitely worth the time you need and you want the magic of emotion, all the fun stuff in VCSI. But if you do have a single ESXi host, there are ways to update it. So the fact that VMUG Advantage program can get a little bit behind, a few months behind us on the very latest releases, not a big deal anymore because you can just update on your own is my point. And um, all these links I tell you today, they're gonna be in my PowerPoint. So this article is what I'm talking about, how to update VMware using the latest ESX CLI. And I give you the scenarios, who does this apply to? Uh, well, a lot of people, <laughs> including me. I don't always feel like uh, vMotioning my VCSA somewhere else. That can take a while and it's pretty big. Um, so the host I'm running this on, uh, let me give you a quick little tour here. So you see my home office here. I got triple monitors, 2560, 1440 in the middle. It's running to a, this GPU that's installed in my ESXi host in the next bedroom over. So no noise, no heat in the office I'm in, just triple monitors with very little watt burn keeping things cooler and quiet since I'm working from home like you know you guys. I've worked at home though at least one day a week for all almost 30 years of my IT career. So setting it all up, you know, something I was pretty used to, but having vSphere 7 be the underpinnings of all this. Right now I'm talking to you on a Windows 10 VM that has a GPU pinned to that VM and my keyboard and mouse mapped to that VM. So I'm I'm goofy enough with my you know home lab tinkering that it's not so much a lab, some of it's production. I actually bought a vSphere Essentials license for that, so I could actually open trouble tickets. Because uh, even as a Dell employee, it doesn't matter. I still, you can't open a ticket unless you have um, the basic version, and then you spend another three hundred dollars to do um, on a per incident basis opening a ticket. All right, let's get to the actual deck. But yeah, I just wanted to say that we all have our challenges working from home, <laughs> and I actually added that challenge by having uh, a limited budget and trying to run everything on one machine that has. 12 Xeon D cores. And that works quite well for video rendering and all the stuff I do. And um, my cockpit here, my three monitors, I actually remote desktop to my Dell issued workstation for my day job. And that's in a different room in my house as well, keeping the noise and heat out. That works out quite well for me um, with dual factor authentication and uh, local network login only to RDP because RDP is scary these days. And no ports open on my firewall as we're all working from home. You don't want anyone tapping on your front door and trying to get anything past your not firewall, especially uh, with them taking advantage of, you know, people working from home. All right. So getting to the slide deck here, let's move my, let's move the video off screen here. So that's me and um, a bit of background here. I'll just say that this VCP thing in 2005, so right here on my wall, I mean, that's, where a lot of us got started trying to get one of those. And this is for, uh, number, what am I, 2681, so pretty early days. And the story there was a customer in Connecticut, large pharmaceutical needed uh, someone who was VCR certified and they would sign for a six month uh, contract that I was writing up at a statement of work and I was uh, at IBM at the time. So in 2005, um, yeah, at a pharmaceutical, you need a month of training and the certification. There's no way they let me in the door without it. Called my manager, said, hey, can I go to Chicago? Three grand for the boot camp." two grand for travel and hotel, five grand investment. I was like, yeah, do it if it's gonna get us a six month thing. And that's how I got started with VCP. We each have our own story. It took years. I was already using VMware for five years at that point, including GSX. So it's frustrating to not be able to make a business case until that day when I had a six month contract hanging in the balance. And it was difficult to pass and I only had like one week to study and one week for the class. It was brutal to try to finish in 14 days with two little kids at home. So we all have those kind of stories, right? But just pointing that out, I'm super grateful for the program and all it's you know, done for me in the, in the many years since. Um, I already disclosed that. I'm not here in conjunction with my employer today. Here I'm as a blog, a content creator. Most, a whole lot of articles about vSphere, but other tech stuff too. And we'll talk briefly about some of that. 
my home lab history. So I was getting a bunch of hand me down gear, like many of you here, uh, you know, 2U, 3U rack mount server stuff. It was burning a lot of watts. And I finally had to say to my wife, hey, I've got, you know, a thousand pounds and a half rack in the basement. I can't leave it running. It's kind of like leaving a diesel truck running in your house 24 seven at idle. Only occasionally do you rev up the throttle when you're actually doing stuff with the VMs. It was $700 electricity a year. It's insane here in Connecticut. And that's just common in the Northeast to have high, high electricity prices. So, and you guys in New Jersey too, of course. So I had to fix that. I'm like, I cannot blow that kind of money that I could not expense to my employer and just, you know, it, it flushed down the toilet. So that's where my quest to get something efficient and quiet enough that other people could just buy and run in their homes as well. Maybe even in a bedroom, not so much just in a basement. So that just gives you an idea of some of my background and why I started blogging. It was about RAID cards on VMware at that time. I wrote an article, I thought no one would read it. It was about LSI RAID controllers that were popular because they were one of the few drive controllers that were uh, fast and performant with VMware. And 10,000 people read them. Ooh, wow, I had no idea there were that many humans in the world that gave a hoot about an LSI RAID controller on ESX uh, 4.x, whatever it was at the 2011. So that's how I got started, documenting how I got things working in a VMware environment and how do you manage that RAID adapter. Uh, we'll get into a bit of a demo, um, some of the challenges I encountered. And I got screenshots of like five, six, seven of them. Uh, if any of you on the phone also tried 7 at out, you probably had your own little bumps in the road. Luckily, they're minor though. Overall, it's been a stable release. So career-wise here, um, part of my time at IBM there, I got to do a red book in 2015, or 2014, excuse me, before vSphere 6 came out. And that means you're helping write a book for a product that hasn't been released yet. And it's called vVols. So vVols, let me just kill, mute the phone here. vVols for one hour. Um, those early days, I had beta releases every week from VMware. So that's where I got used to beta testing. I've been beta testing software a lot of my career um, and somewhat hardware too. I used to get early releases when working there. So I had the privilege and honor of doing that kind of work. I found that kind of fun. Being the lab rat for installing ESXi, getting all the hosts running, installing it over and over, and then finally you know, automating it uh, later into my career. So we all have our own career path. Here's my convoluted career path with a whole lot of changes in the last decade. All right, and that's a little bit about what I do on the side. And if you're interested in following me there, you'll see a whole lot of tech topics, not just about VMware, certainly. Particularly about efficiency in general and home efficiency and, and, and cars as well. Okay, I, I like this one just to point out if some, some of you are in the, on the younger side starting out in your career, Matt, this guy I know quite well. Um, he's still living here in the Northeast. He asked, what's your career path? So I went and summarized it for him. That is a goofy path. I didn't do anything pre-sales until only the last three and a half years or so. That's quite a career pivot, you know, a good 20 plus years into my career. Not the most common thing to do that late and change jobs at many times, but um, I think the blog is what really kind of structured and, and had me taking notes. All those years before, a lot of it was secret clearance work and going to DC and I couldn't even talk about the stuff I was working on anyway. It was kind of a, a release in 2010 and 2011 where I could start you know, writing about whatever I wanted to. And there's the VVOL story I was telling you about where I had the opportunity to actually uh, live in Germany for a month. It's pretty awesome. Kids had just gone off to college. I asked my wife, she supported me and off I went. They paid to put me in an apartment and the catch was you got to write a book. <laughs> you got to help write a book, uh, hundreds of pages of PDF and get through that. And I was doing the lab work and some of the words for that. It was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of fun. All right. Why um, and who? So we already talked about that. Often it's people just trying to get their DC, the VCP. You know, an Intel Nook will do if you're just trying to do some of the basics and trying to get through an exam, that's fine. And then you turn it off when you're done and you're trying to spend the least amount of money. That's not where I've spent most of my time. I, I like to run and leave running the latest code, including remember this Windows 10 VM I'm talking to you on now, that's running in a vSphere 7.0 update 1A environment. So by staying at the bleeding edge with my daily driver machines, it keeps me on my toes. It's kind of self uh, punishing and it can be rough some days. It can be brutal and you can have problems with backup products and so forth, but uh, that's how I learn. So I learn best by hands-on like many of you, I suspect. So that's that's the audience though, what most people with home labs, but for me, it's been a little different, well beyond just certifications, trying to understand the product and keep on top of uh, what it's actually like. So when I'm talking to customers about 7.0 update one and its performance improvements, I've actually seen them in my home lab. I'm not just talking about them. That helps me bring my stories to life when I'm in front of customers. Many of you I'm sure are talking, uh, representing partners or your company or, or whatever, you have to present to other people. And um, 
fun thing about the V-Mugs, they've been very supportive. They even did a giveaway here in Connecticut, trying to help Connecticut get off the ground. We're right between Boston and New York. We get a lot of V-Mugs within a four hours drive. I've spoken at most of them. We have five V-Mugs within a three hour drive of me. So it's a lot of V-Mugs and it can be a little tough to uh, stand out in the crowd. V-Mug organization has been very good to you know all of us, including some uh, giveaways and the whole V-Mug Advantage program. All right, when do people do this? This is what I think about. This is, remember my story of 2005 and trying to pass the certification exam with two young kids at home and go off and do a six month contract where for the first time in years, I wouldn't be flying all over the country. I'd be commuting an hour to work every day for six months, completely uh, changing where I could actually eat dinner with my family for the first time in years, right? It was a big deal, but there's a lot of pressure to pass that darn test. So um, I get it. And sometimes people just want a solution that's absolutely gonna work. Uh, they put the kids to bed at nine on a Saturday or something, and now they gotta get the thing working by 2 a.m. Absolutely, and that's what I—that's what a lot of my folk blog posts have been about. Once you get ESXi installed and you're in a stable support environment, what can you do with it? And a lot of my articles are about that as well. What kind of VMs do I run? Don't forget this, that was already mentioned at the beginning by someone else, for those of you who joined probably around 9, 10 a.m. Someone mentioned, yeah, you're gonna have to reapply for vExpert. That includes uh, me, even though I've been in the program for years. Uh, just keep that in mind. Don't fall asleep at the wheel and miss that because then you won't be a vExpert for 2021. That'd be kind of sad, especially if you already did the work of giving back to the community. We already talked about that. You guys have your own discount code. That's fine. Take your Trihazard discount code. Proud to offer that. It's a nice tie-in with that organization. Without VMUG organization, which is not a VMware company, they're not owned by VMware, we wouldn't have access to code. Me included, working at giant behemoths like um, IBM and Dell. I still don't have access to code through those mechanisms. I still got to get it some other way. And that's a, a great program for that. All right, this is the article I told you about where even if you're a little bit back level with slightly older ESXi code in your lab, just go in and do it with the CSX CLI command. And then, um, yeah, this is crazy. Uh, that article has passed 100,000 views. That is good and not good. <laughs> it's a little frightening. I, I, it shows how much demand there is for, how about you just give me help upgrade button and let her rip pull it from the web. Why are you having me type this command and go to Paul's little blog on how to do that? So I find that almost embarrassing <laughs> that the article is that popular. Um, it's weird. So VMware can be a little rough on home labbers and people that, well, they'll frankly go and jump over to Hyper-V if they get hit too many bumps in the road, just trying to upgrade the appliance. So maybe you go and install 7.0 and you haven't figured out how to upgrade without VCSA and the lifecycle management that's built into it. You know, those little hurdles are what I like helping folks pass. And it's been a lot of you know fun to talk to those people that places like VMworld where they could come up on a pedestal and so forth. All right, I just talked 15 minutes nonstop rattling off my mouth. Any questions about anything I said so far? I'll just take a 20 second break here and you guys unmute as needed. Oh, wow, we have 44 participants. That's awesome. Again, thank you, Ben, for doing this. That's a lot of people, that's great. I think that's more than we jammed in the room with uh, Dave and Busters. Anyone have any questions about anything I said so far? Great stuff so far, Paul. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll move along. All right, so we talked about exam cramming to some people, um, SATA SSTs, why did I move on? Well, IT pros just getting start and, and try to give them a tip. If you're gonna spend 1500 to 2500, it'd be great to spend your money wisely. NVMe drives have been a game changer. I would never recommend a SATA drive to anyone to run VMs off of anymore. I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's a huge thing. And I've got props and a whole bunch of gear on my table to show you in a bit. What else? DNS. <laughs> Who cares about DNS? Well, when I take this thing on the road, remember I'd fly like in Southwest Airlines, I'd put my 15 pound cube server along with this router on the plane with me and a battery um, sometimes if I was um, you know, using check luggage, lead acid battery, a UPS, and show that this little data center on the road did everything. It didn't rely on Windows Server or SQL Server or Windows domain controllers. No. For a $129 router, which I've now gone to $199, but still pretty low price point, an appliance, a metal box, it's doing my DNS, DHCP routing functions. Why do you care? Well, I want host names. I want fully qualified domain names that VMware requires all in a, a router. Consumer routers generally do not do that. I want vcsa.lab.local to work for many machines in my house without trickery of editing host files. Some of you have been around a while, you know what I mean by editing host files. It's a complete hack. You need, your DNS should just work. 
whether it's Windows or Linux that lights up in your network, if you fire up some appliance and it has a name, wouldn't it be great if your router figures that out and just broadcast that name to other peers in the same network? That's what this router's done for me. So I've written a lot of articles about this router, how it made all the difference for me, publicly demoing vSphere on the road. And guess what? I cloned the config in this router for the second one that's right here on my desk. Those of you looking at video here, and actually you probably aren't, I don't know, it depends on how you have your screen set up. But right over here is my one gig, Cox gig communications gigablast router right under my finger there in this room. That thing has been a huge blessing and I've had it for almost over four years now, coupled with uh, Euro routers in bridge mode for Wi-Fi, where I'm not giving Amazon my DNS privileges. Nope, Ubiquiti is doing my DNS and DHCP. And Euro is just my pass through wired to gigabit Wi-Fi devices. So that combination has worked extremely well for my home network. And in the middle of the testing, the Euro Pro 7, sorry, Euro Pro 6 with Wi-Fi 6 that just came out. Um, got it all of last week. It's over in there, there in the desk. And then finally, this guy comes to my house tomorrow, the actual iPhone. 12 Pro Max, so they'll have Wi-Fi 6. So I'll be able to test the speed of that. So that's the kind of thing I cover in my articles. It's not just, you know, what we do with our vSphere lab. It's how do we run our whole lab and nowadays our home office smoothly. That's my production stuff. So remember, I'm a little different. Lab is not really the right word for me. It's more like compact home data centers, what I do, including graceful shutdown when the power goes out. I don't want all my VMs to just abruptly get their power cord yanked. I want them to gracefully shut down and then the ESXi itself self shut down when the power goes out. So I've got that covered in my articles too. So I'm, a, I'm very, I'm, I'm different than a lot of other sites that only talk about scripting and um, automating massive deployments for enterprise. That's not so much my bag, even though my day job, a lot of that is about enterprise. I try to keep it simpler on the home front for articles like this that can apply to anyone. Here's another one. Maybe you were paying attention when I showed you my vSphere. That's actually Chrome, but notice you don't see any bookmarks. You don't see a bunch of junk at the top. It's just the vSphere UI. It looks kind of like an app, but it's actually Chrome. Notice how much more visual real estate you get by getting rid of all this top, the tab, the URL, and then the bookmarks into this. So that's just called Chrome Application Shortcuts. It's been around for years. Got articles for you on that. I'm going to jump over and give you an example. I've been passionate about that stuff for a long time. Remember um, Adobe Flash? I don't think anyone's shedding a tear that those days are gone. Right, there's the left. Doesn't that look like a long time ago now? But some of you in your day jobs, you still might even be using that. I know that's the reality, right? In the real world, it takes a long time. Um, this is me writing way back in 2012. Here's how to make application shortcuts. <laughs> so that's eight years now I've been doing this. The Mac world doesn't really have that, by the way. So you get a lot of Mac people that don't produce content that talk about Windows, where frankly, a majority of people are at. Mostly Windows 10 these days for people's day job. There's the article I was talking about, and then I liked it so much, I rewrote it and cleaned it up and published it again a year later in March, 2017. This is at the time, how many UIs VMware has? <laughs> That's too many UIs, but luckily Adobe Flash has taken away some of those. And we, you know, we don't use the uh, C-sharp client here at all. So most of those have gone away, right? It was just years of transition there. That was frankly kind of painful. Okay, back to the deck, enough of that. But you guys see the deck here, it's got links, right? No need to take notes or have me typing this in chat. It's all coming to you in the deck, it's fine. You'll be able to click on any of this stuff. We'll launch right to the article. All right, this is me and my craziness taking a white box machine. Supermicro basically provides systems that are pretty generic, bare bones, whatever you want to call them. They're so generic, they don't even have a sticker in the back. <laughs> and I found that awkward. Um, I don't sell anything or ship anything. There's a guy in a company called Wired Zone that I met with in Florida and he came up with, a, I worked on a build procedure with him to ship out machines that will work with ESXi, 5.0, 6.0, 6.5, And now with some um, investment from numerous parties, 7.0. So we now have a four year old platform or so that still has support even for the latest 7.0 update one that came out uh, last month, including update one. That's reassuring. People can sleep well at night and over a thousand people have bought this system knowing it's gonna work. It's fully supported, and if they want, they can open a trouble ticket. If they want to run a small business on it, it only has one power supply, not ideal for that, but still a $1,500 starting price point, pretty amazing for two 10 gig interfaces. And that's what this sticker is showing you is just my attempt to uh, buy an expensive label printer with a precision cutter. Think of it like an X-Acto blade operated by a robot arm to precisely cut this vinyl sticker that doesn't leave residue behind and can be repositioned if you screw it up. That took a lot of engineering help from one of my older, one of my two sons to help me out with that. 
it was a lot of fun as a value add to ship out this, you know, low cost sticker as a value add so that you knew what the heck it plugs into what when you bought your machine. I enjoy that stuff. Helping people um, get the thing operating a little quicker from when they unbox it till it's running ESXi, those little things matter. You need to know what plugs into what and what goes to what, to what device. Over here on the right are some of the highlights of ZND. This is not a super micro story. I have Gigabyte and I have a third company that's not in the US yet. I have three different brands and four nodes that I test. So again, I wanna emphasize, I don't necessarily care who makes stuff. I just know ZND has been a huge boon for home labs, for VMware, because it doesn't have a VGA or any kind of GPU or GPU accelerator burning watts that you wouldn't be using for VMware generally. So it does away with that. It doesn't have IDE and all kinds of low old legacy slots. It's just, they call it system on a chip. It's really motherboard with a bunch of chips, but even the 10 gig is baked right in and soldered on the motherboard. That's been good and bad. It's been a little bit of a liability for some people. It has some trouble with 10 gig, but for the most part, it's been very good because it dramatically reduced the watt burn. This thing can idle at 30, 40 watts, crank up to 70, 80, maybe 90 when you need it. And then there's a 12 core version that came to market based on a uh, consumer demand where the, uh, they went and made these systems for people visiting Wired's on site and um, actually custom made that SKU and 200 of those sold too. So that's what I use my daily drivers at 12 core. This was way before AMD Ryzen came along with the rise of a lot of cores. This is four years ago. I had 10 gig and 12 cores in home lab. Most people, when I present at user groups, have never even heard of this. It's the weirdest thing. ZND is poorly marketed. ZNE is what you've heard of at work. All right. Uh, moving along here, what would the future look like? 2021. Well, there's more to come. AMD is doing well, as most of you probably heard. I see people lighting up chat here. Here we go. Is there a way to include 10 gig for vSAN? Yeah, vSAN is tough. If you want to do vSAN right, you would need four hosts. And that's a pretty significant investment. And the price gets a little much. So if you try to equip four of these towers, they do cost a little more than the one use. The one use are noisier. There's a, there's a ZND and a one U package, which has very little cooling and very little room for drives. Now you've got a pickle. How do you do a vSAN efficiently if you can't put many drives in each node? So the people that are real serious about vSAN, they would literally buy four of these towers because you actually have room for, you can make it hybrid and spinning 2.5s, or you can put uh, 3.5s, excuse me, or you can put 2.5 inch SSDs in these bays. Either way, you can make a decent size vSAN, but it's not supported. Uh, I'm just gonna say that right up front. You can do 10 gig and vSAN will perform decently, but official support for a system this low end that starts at $1,500 or the $1,100 one U variants, it's not officially supported. Now there is a corner case with a large, I think it was military or some customers actually got a particular SKU of a particular part with particular NVMe drives supported. But even that had only one NVMe drive, one SATA drive in each node. You're talking about a $12,000 proposition for a modest performer. So I'll confess, I don't run vSAN full-time my home lab and leave four nodes going. When I'm not doing a demo like today, I only leave my one node running. Uh, again, trying to lower the watt burn of my impact on the uh, planet for all my work. And that works well. I do my day job by remotely controlling a laptop. I do my evening work blogging and rendering 4K videos of uh, GoPro footage I take from on the road and Camtasia footage I take from how to do stuff in vSphere. And I do all that with one system. That to me is a success story, you know, efficiency taking the ant. So not what you wanted to hear necessarily in vSAN. Nested vSAN is a whole different world. If you want to do nesting, this would be a great platform for that. How about fire up four ESXi hosts as VMs and make them a vSAN cluster? I'm all for that. That'd be a great learning exercise and all that. I'm just saying it'd be a bit brittle and a bit expensive to run full time to actually buy four hosts to do it kind of properly. And people try with Intel Nooks with USB adapters with one gig interfaces. Your speed is not going to be great. That's, that's the thing. I'm kind of a speed enthusiast and I don't like waiting for stuff. So there's just a lot of compromises there when you go all the way down to an Intel Nook because it's frankly, most of them are laptop style CPUs. This is a real server, what we're talking about here. Okay. So right there, four starter nodes and one chassis. I still have that dream. People have been asking me that since 2017 when I flew with 200 pounds of gear to VMworld and had it all on display. Five different Dell employees came up to me at the time like, yeah, could someone just sell a turnkey solution with four nodes of vSAN all in one kind of chassis and make it affordable? I love that idea. Um, I'm all for dreams like that. And I think it'd be great if it had, maybe it was crippled for only, I don't know, 20 VMs or you got to re-up the license every year, kind of you do it like you do with VMware Advantage, whatever. It'd be great to get, whether it's vSAN or even VxRail, which is Dell EMC's variant of it, in enthusiast hands, like IT pros that are here on the phone. 
that's a difficult dream. My day jobs have not had a whole lot to do with the low end products. They have to do with the high end, like many of us trying to make a living. That's been a challenge. And, and working at VMware for two and a half years, I traveled so much, like 25,000 miles of driving last year. There was not a whole lot of time for the uh, side projects of blogging and uh, making a hardware slash software combo dream become reality. So we all have our dreams. This is me just being clear with mine. 2011, uh, 2021 looks bright. Lots of new platforms from both Intel, hopefully, if they finally break past 14 nanometer, they've been stuck for a long time, and then AMD with a lot of high core counts. So exciting times ahead and some partner companies I, I know of, and I keep working on that. Um, okay, a couple other comments in the chat. I'm gonna take a pause here. We're almost at the top of the hour anyway, a good moment for a pause. You know what? I just wanna share, show them on the video for people sharing at the desk so they don't have to click on their chat. So for those of you that are too lazy to click in your chat window and find the button in Zoom, there it is, right in front of your eyeballs on the screen on my shared desktop. Okay, Pitney Clusters, yep. Here's a home lab or Proxmax. Yeah, Proxmox is um, another solution, not just Hyper-V. I'm thinking more professionals though that might use Hyper-V at work and most definitely use VMware at, home, at work. There's definitely an advantage to using what you work on at your day job, but I understand Proxmox for uh, running VMs for consumers products and you know video encoding and all. I get it, you know, easier to set up, that's fair. Uh, Ubiquity hardware, yep. Um, a lot of people say that about it. I, should have bought mine four or five years earlier. I was very happy when I found the router. Some people go with their Wi-Fi, but since I support my uh, parents and friends and family, I found Eero a whole lot more consumer friendly to set up in minutes at their houses. Um, it wasn't really interested in UNMS and managing multiple houses ubiquity, looking to simplify as my uh, parents and, and siblings get older rather than inject myself in their life and tie myself to them permanently. So I tend to go with consumer stuff for the other households. Uh, here we go. Sabrin, yes, very happy with Sabrin. I went and bought their four terabyte. So I love these comments. This is the part I miss most about publicly presenting in front of you guys in a room where people can just raise their hands. So let's just take a moment to hear, look here. There's me talking about Synology, by the way. Uh, here's the Sabrin. This is a major investment, $800 plus, but it's TLC. It's fast. I can write a VM and it can handle it. And Samsung doesn't make one. So Samsung's still stuck at two gigs. So I went with four, four terabytes. This is my daily driver for VMs. And I'll be rebuilding my Windows 10 VM on there soon. I've got a Windows 10 VM I've been running for like three and a half years that you guys are seeing me around on now. And I've got numerous reasons to kind of re rebuild from scratch with the latest build 2004 on Windows 10. And a nice fresh VM built under UEFI mode, by the way, on PC or 7. Anyhow, Sabrent, what is that company? Highly performant, very mature, really good NVMe controllers. They're just a lesser known brand from Germany. In Europe, they're hot. There's really no worries about that. Putting heat sink on, by the way, sped it up. And there's me doing performance testing. I even have a FLIR thermal camera where I aim it at devices and see how it heats up. And yeah, I'm very impressed with this four terabyte drive. That's a major investment. <laughs> and I know PCIe 3 is what's limiting it, but nobody makes a PCIe 4 one. They came out with one last week that's four terabytes PCIe 4. But guess what? It's QLC, quad level cell. It hurts on sustained rights, uh, sustained rights. Well, guess what happens when you clone a Windows VM or you do VM work? That's a sustained right. <laughs> or when you work with huge 4K video files like GoPro footage I've been playing with lately. Huge files, that's sustained throughput needed. So I'm not a big fan of QLC when I can help it. I try to stay with TLC um, and VME drives for top performance. That's just me. And I know I'm blessed with a, a budget finally to have a blog that's self-sustaining enough to help me fund such projects. I write about the stuff I buy. Almost nothing I get is free whenever it is or provided, I disclose that at the top of an article or a video. Um, FTC requires you to do that anyway. Uh, so anything paid promotion, I, I generally steer away from. I buy stuff, I use it for months. If it works well, then I blog about it. Let's go back to that chat for a second. Yep, USG, yeah, no, I, I agree. Maintenance, using uni, Unify and having it centralized access, pretty awesome. And I've looked at it, I've used their appliance, I've tested it. They had a Docker appliance at one point. I, I keep on top of it, but yeah, I just haven't gone to it for the, the reasons I mentioned before. Um, and I'm okay with it. And, and frankly, I, I like writing about Eero because it's such a consumer product that many hundreds of thousands or millions of people would be buying now that Amazon bought them. But I'm sidestepping the whole Amazon privacy thing by not using their DNS at all. All right, more comments about USG. Um, Thunderbolt, yeah. Okay, Thunderbolt's been, William Lamb's done a fantastic job on this, moving the needle on Apple products, where 
one processor. I don't, you know, that's not going to run Linux or Windows or VMware. So, he, but he's had success with getting ESXi to run on more stuff, including Mac Mini. So that, it's good because if you have a Thunderbolt, if you have a consumer product with Thunderbolt, you can do a 10 gig converter. So I do have an article about a 10 gig device I bought at one point here. Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, USB. How did I do it? All right, so yeah, there it is. Ooh, that's old and pricey. Not exactly ideal to have a metal box hanging off the back of an Intel Nook or whatever that's almost as big as the Intel Nook. It gets a little crazy. Um, and these docking stations and stuff, they still haven't gone with 10 gig. That frustrates me too. Why do I keep talking about 10 gig? Well, guess what? Because Synology is there. <laughs> they're going 10 gig and they're announcing more and more products with that. So. Yeah, if you're using VMs and you want decent speed, you'd want 10 gig in a home lab. And again, it's been around for four or five years. Most of the kinks worked out. All right, let's move along in the presentation up. But it, I'll just pause though, before we take this little break for any other questions. And I'm actually gonna ask to uh, give your give your uh, brains a fun break and get you engaged with your mouse. If you can look up a little in Ben, can you send out the questions? Now they're gonna come in one big chunk so instead of breaking up my talk with questions to keep you uh, awake every few minutes, the way you know Ben and I are just experimenting here with Zoom polling. So welcome to the world's first poll for a VMUG. So instead of scrolling down, let's just answer the first one here. Um, this one's important to Ben and let's give our feedback to you, Ben. So those of you that are awake and alert, please pay attention to your Zoom for a minute. Go look at your screen. The New Jersey VMUG is asking you a question. And I'm gonna go ahead and answer right in front of all the rest of you on what I would like to see in a future VMUG. What would help me most of my day job? Right there, probably VMware Cloud and AWS. All right, anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, ben, when you're done with the poll, I guess if you can maybe share your screen at some point, you can show us the answers to all, right? That'll be fine. We'll save that for the end. So once we submit yeah, all that our works. So notice the submit button's gonna be gray until you fill out the radio boxes. So what year was Tinker Try website started? Well, that one's a softball question. I actually give you the hint right there in option four. <laughs> so if you can do a little math and think about, uh, hmm, what's nine years ago? Well, that's gonna be your answer. A little more relevant to your jobs. How's VVols capitalized? Oh my gosh, VMware's actually flip-flopped this more than once driving those of us who work with technical marketing teams and documentation a little bunkers. And you have blog posts and all that or PDS from years ago and you're not gonna change those. Very painful when you change capitalization. And then some of you, I understand your brain just doesn't care. You don't care if you see VMware with a capital W, it doesn't bother you at all. We're not all wired the same, I'm well aware of that. So I'm having a little fun with you in these questions. But this is the answer by the way, lower case fee is where VMware's gone. All right, shout it out, unmute your microphones. What does NVMe stand for? Who wants to boldly answer that right in front of all your peers and embarrass yourself with the wrong answer potentially? Come on, <laughs> have a little fun. And of course you're Googling away and you're getting the answer and you're, and you're cheating, I, I know. <laughs> oh boy, no takers, everyone's just staying muted. All right, we'll whip right through these questions. Non-volatile memory express, what NVMe stands for. VMUG stands for VMware User Group. PMEM, it is persistent memory. There is no such thing as AMD 3D Crosspoint. That's an Intel product, by the way. Okay, home lab clusters. I'm not gonna tell you this one, okay? Someone's gotta go off mute and please answer question seven and tell me what your thinking is or experiences. This is a fun one. It's kind of controversial. Your results may vary but I really want to talk about seven for just a moment. Anybody out there willing to go off mute and tell me a little bit about what you've done in your home lab and what have you noticed about booting off of USB versus- Never noticed it slow anything down? There you go. It's a mythic, I, I, I've even timed the boot time of ESXi itself. People think, well, put ESXi in an NVMe drive, it'll boot quicker. Mm. <laughs> Whether it's a state of drive or an NVMe drive, the ESXi boot time is gonna be 20, 30, 40 seconds in that range. It varies by maybe 10, 20%, whether it's USB two or three, it doesn't matter. It's loaded in RAM and your VMs run full speed. 
So a lot of rookies in the VM world, the home lab world, they'll, they'll worry about that too much. And for me, remember I'm constantly testing stuff. So I'll, I'll image a USB drive, I'll back it up. So if my ESXi upgrade goes poorly, I don't have support. I don't want to open a $300 trouble ticket per instant basis. I just put the old USB drive and I'm back. Now with vSAN that all changes because they're starting to do writes on there. And I'm starting to experiment with this concept of rather than just a commodity flash drive that was really never meant for um, uh, high writes, well, vSAN's starting to write files there. So what if you do a little USB adapter with a micro SD card that's meant for photography? It's meant for handling you know, 4K video streams from a GoPro. Maybe that's a little bit better boot medium. It's only 25 bucks instead of say 15 for a 32 gig. So yes, I'm always on the lookout, but in a home lab, the ability to move these around to different hosts and test, VMware and certificates gets a little tricky doing that. But man, for my testing, it's been a huge boon to be able to just pop out the drive, clone it with a disk imaging utility. Now upgrade the cloned image. If the clone goes great, cool. Because remember, I don't have Nikivo and Veeam. They don't work when a product first comes out. And you're not backing up your ESXi hypervisor itself. And you might have done a lot of customization to it. So that's what my articles tend to focus on is how to get around that stuff. So yes, for a home lab, don't worry about it. It doesn't slow down. This one, pretty softball question. Hopefully most of you have heard the MVME acronym by now. It is the way to go if you want performance. A lot of it is Q depth. You can have a whole bunch of VMs booting at once, boot five VMs. If you try to do that on a SATA drive, oh my God. Let's just say you try to boot two VMs off of a laptop SATA drive at once in VMware Workstation. Good luck with the speed, it tanks. It takes more, way more than twice as long to boot because the drive is thrashing. Even though there's no spinning rust or you know head seeking, it's still a miserable proposition on SATA. You're totally being held back by the 540 megabytes per second throughput and the freaking low Q depth and all. NVMe is absolutely the way to go for VMFS data stores and home lab, if you can afford it. I know it costs more per gigabyte. Absolutely worth it if that's where you run your VMs. And if you give a hoot about performance of those VMs. Okay, question nine, we're in the home stretch here. What's it you did to NVMe drive? Anybody know? Stick of gum? Question. Somebody had an answer? It's like a stick of gum, large. Well, NVMe um, M.2 is a gum stick like. So bullet, one, question one was a trick question. If I had written M.2, it would be correct. But U.2 is much more rare. And I've got a prop for you that give you the answer. It's, it's right here. So for those of you looking at my camera, if you want to bring up your zoom and bring up the view a little better, it looks like a laptop drive. So it's a thick. 2.5 inch laptop drive. The back has some uh, thermal um, bumps there for heat dissipation, aluminum extruded case. So this is what U.2 looks like. And it's not SATA on the back. It's a different kind of connector. And then the other end is the gum stick form factor. Here's a cable they sell you. So if your motherboard has a gum stick, you know, M.2 connector, you can have an M.2 to U.2 adapter cable that comes with some Intel products. So there you go. You got a quick tutorial on U.2 versus M.2. Hopefully you guys actually remember that. That's hopefully you learned something today. That's kind of the point, right? So it uh, looks like a thick 2.5 inch SSD. And then finally, would you be interested in supported? Okay, so I'm gonna take that off camera. I want you to answer that. I'm gonna go ahead and hit submit on my own. But that last one, go ahead and finish your surveys on your local machines. Some of you cheated, some of you didn't, it's fine. Um, but the last one really matters and the first one really matters. First one matters to Ben, last one matters to me. Hit submit and let's continue. Now at the end, Ben can, um, reveal at the bottom of the hour what the survey results are. So thank you again, Ben, for helping set all that up. Let's move along. Sure, we've, we've got about 25 people uh, have submitted so far, just FYI. Oh, that's wonderful. That's way more participation ahead than the DCV mug. You guys are great. Again, for speakers, that's the most lacking thing. It's so much fun when you're in a room with people, you just have them raise their hand. You get a sense of what's out there, right? Hard to do on Zoom. Okay. Um, 10 gig, I use that word a lot. So switches has still been a problem. Mine's three years old now and I spent $780 on a neck gear switch and it's kind of loud, so it's in my basement. Not great, but now they're starting to come up with fanless ones that can be right in your home office. Some cheaper brands, not gonna be like the Cisco you might be used to at work, but hey, we're getting finally some progress in 10 gig, but it has not taken off like I had hoped. We're still stuck at a lot of 2.5 kind of gamer motherboards. They haven't really gone to 10 gig on the mass uh, numbers to motherboards. <laughs> Alex Lopez makes a comment about the shirt. Alex, uh, yeah, I'm going to show you why he says that in a second here. I'll save that for the end, Alex. Thank you. I know Alex personally. I'm 
So glad you're here. It's awesome. There's the 10 gig switch I was mentioning. That's my home lab and me being a efficiency kind of nerd who takes a FLIR thermal camera out for heat and I take out a watt meter for watts. 22 total watts is not too bad a penalty to pay to have 10 gig lit up in your home. And notice I have what is it, about six of the eight ports populated. So yeah, the thing's pretty much running full bore. 22 watts is not a bad penalty. I care about that stuff, especially for home. That is not your focus at work, I realize. All right, that's me. That's my happy place in front of my lab. There's my lab. It's a little messy. That's the real world. Most of this is off camera. This tripod is set up here to aim my iPhone down at this gray mat. And that's where most of my videos are produced right there. Not too fancy. You can see a Synology NAS there. You can see a UPS battery there. I'm pointing with like crazy with my mouse. You see a grayed out box there and a Skunk Works project I'm working on on a machine that's not available in the US at the moment. I'm looking at, you know, looking at options. Here's my uh, mini tower. Um, and you get a sense of scale here. This is not huge. It's like, it takes up a, you know, a little more space than a nook, but it takes up more vertical space. It's, it's just pretty compact. Weighs all of like 12 pounds and I can stuff nine drives in there. Four spinning rust, 18 terabytes, um, and a whole bunch of NVMe drives. You can really put a lot in these little cubes. Here's a motherboard that's just naked running on a uh, anti-static mat with a bunch of NVMe drive gum sticks sticking up as I was playing with vSAN, trying to run vSAN all in one node. Four NIST DDSI instances, each with their own NVMe drive. So that's me doing a little project to see if that's possible, like trying to bring the price down. So, um, and then finally speakers that are Bluetooth connected to my phone. So when I walk into my home lab and I touch this little um, Insteon device that turns on all the lights in the workbench and uh, automatically turns on the Bluetooth receiver. So now everything that my phone was doing, like a podcast I was listening to come out of better speakers with a subwoofer rather than through the tinny little speakers on my phone. Those little details matter. I go up and down stairs and get my exercise running in my basement quite often. And I enjoy that in the evening and I keep all the noise and heat. And I keep my ping pong table freed up to actually use versus the first three years of blogging where I took over the ping pong table in the basement and nobody could play ping pong on it because that was my table where I was filming all my videos. So um, until finally I had enough money to buy a bench. So that's me and the, the roof here. The ceiling is a hung ceiling with LEDs. I finally replaced all the fluorescent and put LEDs in. That was a challenge because the cheap ballast, they're not really ballast, but they tend to flicker, the cheap brands. So that can be a challenge when you're trying to do video if the lights are flickering. All sorts of problems. Pretty much everything you buy tends to disappoint you in some way or another. And that's what my blog posts are all about. What actually worked out? And I focus on what worked. I don't tend to focus on negative articles about stuff that I didn't end up using or returned. These little bins down here are the various projects like upcoming stuff and stuff I finished with. And then I get recycle everything over here on the right. So yeah, that's my workbench. Um, networking switch in the back there. A laptop with a secondary monitor that's USB-C attached. It really gives me dual desktop and that little config. Um, but then upstairs with the triple monitors where I do most of the content creation after filming stuff down there. All right, and then a bunch of drives. And these bins are here, clear, so I can actually see them. And sometimes I'm grabbing stuff live while I'm on camera. It's nice to have stuff within arm's reach so I don't have to cut and edit the video and all. Because like all of you, I have very limited time in evenings to get these things done. Video editing is very painful and arduous. I do not outsource it or have someone do it elsewhere. I just, I do it all myself and there's just so little, so few hours in the day. So everything was with an eye towards efficiency and getting the video content done when I can get, when it's fresh in my mind and I get something done. What do you use to edit your videos? Uh, Camtasia. Maybe I should have gone with a higher end product, but I've been using it. It was $250, not super cheap, um, but it'll do 4K video. And now they have proxy video where I can take GoPro 4K footage and actually edit it on my 2560 by 1440 monitor without stuttering. And remember, I've got a four year old video card. Very few AMD cards are compatible with ESXi. So I'm stuck with four year old technology in the video card, yet I can still crank out 4K video render jobs pretty well with this. In a, in a VM, mind you. So yeah, thanks for asking um, those details. Thanks. Yeah. Keyboard and mouse is another challenge. When you're using a VM as your workstation, you got to use a IP device. Um, let's see if I have one handy to show you that's not plugged in. Yeah, I do not. Um, Silex makes a USB to IP device. So my keyboard and mouse are mapped to my, win my Windows 10 VM because keyboard and mouse is normally a no-no in ESXi land, but remember it's my workstation. So I had to clear all those hurdles. Here's an air quality detector. So I do thermal stuff, I do heat stuff. And again, I feel really blessed after nine years of a thousand articles, I finally got to a point where there's a little bit of a budget to, to buy the stuff, not on you know our normal family budget. Cause there was a continual pain point every year work with my wife trying to further my career and whatever. I needed to have an LLC formed and 
keep it separate. And that's been a huge blessing. Uh, and there's me uh, seeing Falcon Heavy Rocket uh, with my son. I got to see that. That's not my photo, but it brings back a nice memory of going to Florida and seeing that thing take off. The first time they had the triple boosters there and uh, really awesome experience. I've seen the space shuttle go up as a kid too. Uh, here's me taking over the family room TV. My wife was not thrilled about that. Um, why am I doing this? Because I needed to play flights in the or something. And one of my motherboards, the four core, ended up not getting imported into the US. So blogging about it and putting ESXi on it, not super important. It's a ZMD2100 with only four cores, but with a decent GPU I put in there, um, it can multi-boot to ESXi when I need it on occasion, or I just dual boot it over to um, Windows 10 and run Flight Simulator. And here I got a controller and a subwoofer down here from 10 years ago. Hey, I'm not even on a 4K TV. I'm actually a pretty cheap guy. This 1920 1080 is still working quite nicely, but yes, the TiVo now can actually handle 4K. At some point I'll go to 4K, probably for, who knows? Just hasn't been a priority. All right, demo. So I promised time and ooh, 1018, let's, let's do some more demo. So here we go, I'm gonna jump right over. Okay, I've got a screen full of tabs for you here. So you remember I already showed you VCSA and I already hinted, hey, one host has already been updated to update 1A. So 7.0 came out April 2nd. Update 1 came out, was it October 6th? And update 1A came out last week and there I am blogging about it and testing it. Why? Because you remember that article that has crazy 100,000 people plus reading it. I think that was a year ago. So the count's going up. Well, I continually update it. This is just take some time. I get the release notes together. I test out a command. I reboot the machine. I make sure it works. And then I put together um, a transcript of what happened. So basically, so when I took my machine from here to here, here's exactly what it looked like in the ESXCLI command. And here's a transcript of it. So I can actually see all the drivers and stuff that are loaded in it. I'm just weird that way. Cause sometimes something goes wrong and then you got to look back and find out is the state of drivers, the NVMe driver, when did it, when did VMware give me a new version? And I can look through my own transcript and find it and realize what broke it. And again, this is that theme of how do you support yourself when you have no official way to open a trouble ticket with VMware? Um, that's how most of us are in home labs. Okay. Uh, I also mentioned the Kiva backup product. They just came out. So that's pretty quick, three weeks. I think Veeam, I don't happen to, I didn't look it up last night. I think they're not quite there yet with update one support. So unfortunately 7.0 doesn't mean all backup products that are 7.0 compatible will keep working forever. Unfortunately, it turns out when update one came out, it was a significant update and it broke backup vendors again. That happened last year with 6.7 as well. Uh, this is just the way it is. That's our reality. Actually, it was two years ago. It happened spectacularly. So that's what home labs like being on the bleeding edge. You might break a backup, you break your backup. Um, let's go back to the lab and show you some of this stuff. So here's some VMs. Here's what I do. Auto started folder. What's this? This one is back is looking at my CyberPower UPS. Okay, that's nice. Let's show you what that actually looks like. Here you go. My house is at 117 volts and I'm at 51% load. I've got this thing stuffed full of 18 terabyte drives. Um, not full, one of them is, but let me give you an idea of my data stores. Holy smokes. So I use storage and I tend to be, I use local when possible. And then the um, Synology for occasional overspill or swing projects when I'm rebuilding from scratch, I need some place to put the data. And I label things since these are not iSCSI or shared, these things live in the host. So I very carefully label my data store. So it's super clear to me where this NVMe or uh, SATA SSD lives, which host it's in and what size it is. This sucker's 18 terabytes, right? So that's my backups of uh, VMs and Veeam and stuff. So we all have our ways of doing things, but I try to keep organized, especially in my data store names because it gets really confusing really fast. Here's that Sabrent four terabyte NVMe. That's my Primo top flight storage. And there's the Windows 10 template I'm gonna build and then deploy from when I go and create my new workstation. And there's my ISO library. So let me go back. So what did auto started VMs mean? Like, why do I call it that? Well, because sometimes I even rebuild my VCSA. So if I rebuild VCSA from scratch, cause I'm writing an article, I wanna see how did an upgrade go? How does a VCSA fresh install go? Well, I wanna be able to, um, Say, okay, now I just need to find these five VMs, put them in an auto folder, I'm good. It's not that big a deal for me to rebuild my ASXi host or my VCSA, as long as I keep my names clear and do a screenshot or two before I blow things away and start again. Um, so that's monitoring my UPS's USB cable and telling me if it needs to shut down, if something bad happens. So if I lose power in my house due to an ice storm this winter, 
at least I know this VM is always running because it's auto started and it'll take care of gracefully shutting down ESXi. Nikivo, we already kind of covered. That's just one of several backup products I look at. And it's uh, rather simple and rather home lab friendly because it's an appliance that you can run somewhere in your house outside of your infrastructure. So if your infrastructure, your primary machine croaks, you can restore a lot of your, the VMs you care about. In this case, I'm actually only doing a daily backup with a cyber power UPS. Why? Because they only support, uh, Nikivo only started supporting uh, update 1A like last week. So I just set this up this morning. Moving along, vCenter server itself, you don't do image-based backups. I don't know how many of you knew that. The days of using Nikivo or Veeam or something for VCSA, those are gone. You're supposed to use the built-in product. So when you use VAMI to update it, and let's show you what I mean by VAMI. Let's bring up VAMI. Uh, looks like I already have it going. There's VAMI. That's VCSA, in my case, the appliance name, colon 5040. That's what VAMI is. That's how you do your updates these days. And mine went smoothly. I went and published a video. Even then, and even on update 1A, there was still an error that came up right after the install. So there's been some rough edges from VMware. And I'm going to cover some of those. And then finally, the uh, keyboard and mouse are mapped to an IP to USB mapping device. That's called Silex. And that's what I'm using there. So I'm giving you the idea that I have a whole bunch of shortcuts. And I make things easy. And then when I want to do like out of band management or something, pretty easy for me to bring that up because uh, it's just you know a click away. And you'll notice I have a vSphere profile in Chrome that's just for my sysadmin stuff. Okay. Um, and there's my bias level and so forth. So there, here's my out of band management. If I want to do remote control of a machine, I don't need a keyboard and mouse. You know that those days are gone for me. Until Nook, some of the lower end ones, you don't even have an out of band management. So it, it is nice to have a product that has, you know, iDRAC or ILO or what Supermicro calls iKDM, whatever out of band management, really handy to have for ESXi, as you guys know from your day jobs at work typically, also really handy to have at home. So you can have the machine tucked away in a far corner of your house where it doesn't make noise, doesn't bother anybody. All right, back to a couple of things here. I'll show you an error. Okay, this is odd. Not a big deal, but on 7.0, it worked. Now when I click on learn more, nothing happens. A little disappointing. <laughs> so VMware still can, has some rough edges. We've got a way to report bugs, but I haven't had a whole lot of luck whether whatever company I worked for, whether it's VMware or Dell or IBM, filling this out and getting, getting feedback. You don't get that, unfortunately. So you do have a way to tell VMware when things go sideways, but I haven't had a whole lot of luck seeing bugs I report get fixed, unfortunately. So I've kind of just been um, doing this. So here's my website. Here's my vSphere articles. You click on vSphere and you get all the vSphere 7 articles. There's a lot of them already, all about vSphere 7. All right. But the video library, go to the full playlist of vSphere 7 videos. And sometimes, like this one was nasty, high CPU utilization on 7 OC. It was a bug. So I uh, just show me fixing it. <laughs> So, um, and then here's another, um, so yeah, these videos in the right hands of the right person watching it can really show them some of the life, the, the rough edges I'm working here. Here we have VAMI not working. Um, ESX CLI failed the first time, worked the second. What the heck bug was that? Here's another one with VAMI not working. <laughs> these are just videos that a lot of people are gonna look at unless they run into the same air. There are 378, that's not a lot of people. But guess what? The people I did look for it probably ran into the same darn issue. And we're looking at the video to see if I figured out a workaround, right? So that's an example of me using some evening time to document stuff I find to hopefully help VMware and a workaround if possible to hopefully help everybody else because VMware hasn't written a KB article yet. That's just kind of my mentality of what I do to, you know, in, in my spare time. So with just a few minutes left, anything someone wants me to click on, did something catch your eye on my admin tab where you really want to dive into one of these tabs a little deeper? I didn't really show you Synology, but there's my NAS. Uh, that can do iSCSI or, or Windows shares. I would encourage you to do iSCSI if you really care about VMware mostly, or maybe split it in half, do half iSCSI and half Windows shares. Um, Synology is good at doing that. So uh, any, any questions about anything you're seeing or um, let me look at the chat and catch up on what I missed. Is if it's, we're coming in the last three minutes here, so please unmute your mic at this point. It'd be a great time to uh, just ask your question verbally if you want. Uh, great presentation. I have to jump off for a meeting, but appreciate it. Oh, thank you, John. I, I have to jump off in about 10 minutes myself. I'm going to see the beginning of Synology, but not more than that, unfortunately. We'll see. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thanks. 
Anybody have questions? Uh... Hey, Paul, this is Alex. Uh, not really a question, but just a comment. And it's probably something you can't really show at the moment because it looks like your vCenter is already at the latest version. But the new feature within vCenter alone, when there is a new update, how it prompts the banner at the top of your vCenter window to let you know that there's new updates available. Absolutely. So at the very beginning of this video, you'll see exactly what Alex is talking about. I just recorded this a couple of nights ago, November 9th. So I walk people right through the whole process from beginning to end and really just launches VMware, as Alex is pointing out. So thank you, Alex. Good point. Sure. VMware's made great strides. Once you're on 7.0, because when you go from 6.7 to 7, you're still downloading the ISO for the VCSA appliance, launching its wizard, and it essentially builds a new appliance and moves all your settings and data over. Cool. Once you're done with that longer upgrade, once you're on the 7.0 chain, huge progress. It's the easy button. It's what you wanted for years to finally just update within the product. Loving that, right? And that's great. Um, and that's the VAMI I was showing you earlier. Just the update button's been going well. Just a couple minor rough edges where you get some weird pop-up message sometimes, but that's very minor. We're in the home stretch there. It's been a multi-year quest to get that done. Um, and that's just great to see. And like I said, overall, I'm not bashing 7.0 at all. It's the opposite. It's been the most stable, smoothest rollout, and especially on ZND, super easy. Not worrying about I-350 drivers for the one gig or uh, X557, they're called, for the 10 gig. It's just been out of the box. Fresh install or upgrades, it's all gone very well. So 7.0, big thumbs up for me. It's just some minor rough edges in the VCSA appliance around the upgrade process. And if you don't have a Dell or HP system, you're not really getting the full lifecycle management. So you're going to have some stuff there too. So lifecycle management, um, you know, that that's not all, not all third party, not all OEMs are covered with that yet. Okay, questions. Uh, thanks for show and tell. Yeah, oh, cool. Um, ben, if you could queue up the answers with one, one minute left, the answers to the poll questions. While he's doing that, any other questions folks have for me? Let me see if I show you all my props. Yeah, I pretty much did. Paul, this is Alex. I do have one quick question again, and it's something I know you've covered before previously in one of your blogs, but uh, being able to connect your CyberPower UPS to your lab environment. Um, yeah. Can you kind of go over that maybe? And I thought I saw like a CyberPower VM or something you had there. So it kind of reminded me about that. So. Sure. So um, one of my older articles um, I reached out to CyberPower and said, man, you're the only company that offers this free. This is a really big deal that you gracefully shut down ESXi. Thankfully, it's still supported to this day. Hallelujah. So there, there, uh, where's the article? So this is me writing generically about them. And then the specific article about ESXi itself is right here. So you have an ESXi VM that's looking at monitoring the USB 2.0 cable that's attached to the physical device. And I just threw the URL in the chat. Um, let's see if that made it into my PowerPoint. I'm not quite sure. Ah, and I never finished the PowerPoint. So in the closing moments here, um, I still have some issues. Nobody's home lab's perfect. It's always a work in progress for me. One gig can be problematic at some cable lengths for me, for instance. Um, and remember I mentioned there's some rough edges? Well, this deck has them. So if you run into the same ones, you're likely, if you just do Google searches, for the, you'll find one of my articles anyway. Uh, I had some issues here with uh, USB mapping. Here's another one. Now, most of this is now ancient history from a couple months ago. Most of these errors went away with 7.0 update 1a. But I know there's still people out there that are gonna get the 7.0 or 7.0 update one and still bump into these. So for you and the VMUG, that's what it's meant is peer help here. Um, and these are my issues. This is a nasty one, right? That's gone. You're not gonna be installing 7.0b at this point, but that was bad. Your CPU was nailed and your CPU core saw higher temperatures than ever before, even than Prime 95, which is normally kind of the worst kind of abuse you can inflict on a machine. So that was a rough spot, but it's passed, right? It's now November, that's all ancient history. Uh, one other thing I feel, okay, more, more about 10 gig. Remember I mentioned I had some rough spots with 10 gig. So this is me coming clean about that. Not everyone was happy with it. Um, and I had some other bumps in the road too, like my SSD filling and all the usual stuff people ran into. Memory and CPU exhaustion, yep. I even have a video about this one. And this is me just coming clean on how I did it. And I remember I told you I paid real money to just be a regular user, because I can't, that's, that's what I am. Like you guys, if you put something in production, you've got to open a trouble ticket and you're not really talking about free licenses at that point. 
you talk about vSphere Essentials, which I did. And you can send feedback this way, like I said. It's a constructive way to get back stuff to VMware. Um, hopefully it works. Uh, and then Camtasia is my tool. So somebody asked me what I use and there's my videos. And then finally, uh, this stuff, this is a little rough. Again, if you had Dell or HP in your home lab, your screen will probably look a little less uh, busy here, including what the heck to do about concurrent context attack vectors. Um, future is a bunch of articles I'm planning on. So that's just reference material. There's no way you're gonna be reading it now or will I be reading it loud? But it, it gives you a sense of what's in the hopper in my draft folder for a tinker try in case some of that's of interest to you. And I love it when you leave comments right in the public website. My articles have a comment button at the bottom of them. That's the best place to comment. I'm better at that than email because when I answer a question there, everybody gets the benefit, right? Uh, and then finally, uh, skip that slide because Ben actually already did the feedback on, do you want to see a fanless system? This is all the props I showed you today. So if something I held up caught your attention, like this uh, PCIe card, Optane, that's another form of it, form factor. Um, there it is. And then finally, when I was driving all over the country, uh, all over the East Coast, from DC all the way to Canada, I did a lot of it. And this is my way of saving a whole lot of money per mile. Driving 25,000 miles in one year was a huge leap from a Honda Civic that was 15 years old to something new. So that's been a, a side project of mine, but quite fun. And that's where the 4K, 4K GoPro video comes in, the camera right in the roof there. So having a blast with that, uh, we all need some outlet for a little bit of fun in our lives. That's been a huge success in saving my family money and increasing safety over 30 years of Honda Civic ownership before it. Not too much to do with today's talk, but that's one of my green topics. From 2011, I launched with the word efficiency first in my blog. There's a reason the background color is green. So that's it. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for letting me go a little long. I really appreciate you guys having me today. It was a delight to be here. Sure. So I just uh, shared the results of the poll, Paul. So if you want to scroll nice. through and take a look. And there it is. So operations. So Ben, that you've got a, t a number one hit. NSX introduction is your, your, that's great. So now you guys know what Ben yeah. is here. Yeah, cool. Looks like uh, people got the answers right, of course. And there we go, persistent memory. Yeah, the last one, maybe need to learn more, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess what that's related to would be how many of you run an ESXi host like in your daughter's bedroom, right? Or your office where noise and heat certainly matter. <laughs> you don't want a 200 watt behemoth next to you. It's gonna toast up your office and you don't want noise, so. Reach out to me directly. Um, people that are interested in beta testing or looking at early release videos that I haven't gone public with, whatever. Uh, there's a contact form right in tinkertry.com with all my URLs and how to follow me on Twitter and all that. Thank you again, Ben. Back to you and back to Synology. You're welcome, Paul. Stop thank sharing you. my desk now. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, stop the sharing now. Okay, it's all yours.